1-8, have five to six individuals with AK-47s. Request permission to engage. Roger that. Uh, we have no personnel east of our position, so uh, you are free to engage over. In the Westminster Magistrates Court, between Government of the United States of America requesting state and Julian Assange, defendant. It is now possible to stand back and emphasize that both the prosecution and the extradition request are extraordinary, unprecedented and politicized in a number of striking ways. The actual request issued by the US fundamentally misrepresents the facts in order to bring this case within the bounds of an extradition crime. The actual conduct alleged against Julian Assange is summarized as follows. WikiLeaks and Julian Assange received and published evidence exposing war crimes, torture and atrocities on civilians in the Iraq and Afghan wars and the practice of rendition for torture and interrogation of detainees. Quote, Mr. Assange's vision was that the digital age might allow a new kind of whistleblower and leaking of information that could redress some of the growing imbalance between citizens and governments. Unquote. The Guantanamo detainee assessment briefs provided evidence that Gu Guantanamo detainees had been the subject of prior rendition and detention in CIA black sites before their arrival at Guantanamo and that their detention was arbitrary. In fact, the WikiLeaks revelations served to expose the total unreliability of the justifications put forward for the detention of the prisoners. The Afghan war diaries revealed what seemed to be serious war crimes and included, one, the existence of a black unit operating kill or capture lists and hunting down targets for extrajudicial killings. Two, the killing of civilians, including women and children, Three, the role of Pakistan intelligence in arming and training terrorist groups. Four, the role of the CIA in the conflict, including participation in strikes and night raids. The Iraq War Diaries exposed, one, systematic torture of detainees, including women and children, by Iraqi and U.S. forces, and a secret order by which U.S. ignored the abuse and handed detainees over to the Iraqi torture squad. Two, helicopter killings, including of insurgents trying to surrender. Three, details of 15,000 previously unreported civilian deaths, including those of women and children, showing that the U.S. government was hiding the full civilian cost of the Iraq war. Four details of 23,000 previously unreported incidents in which Iraqi civilians were killed and their bodies were found. The U.S. diplomatic cables exposed evidence of one, CIA and U.S. forces involvement in targeted extrajudicial killings in Pakistan. Two, delivery killing of civilians. Three, Pressure exerted on European countries by US officials not to prosecute CIA personnel suspected of involvement in crimes. 4. The Yemeni government holding Yemeni citizens in prison on behalf of the US despite their own government investigation finding no evidence they were involved in terrorist acts. 5. The US, at the behest of the CIA, was spying on the UN Secretary General, UN Security Council members and foreign diplomats at the UN in New York in violation of international law. Six, US support for certain authoritarian regimes despite their human rights record. Seven, the corruption of the Ban Ali regime in Tunisia, which the US publicly supported, but behind closed doors did not support his continued leadership. Amnesty International described the WikiLeaks publications as a catalyst for the Arab Spring and a, quote, watershed year when activists and journalists use new technology to speak truth to power and push for greater respect for human rights. When repressive governments face the possibility that their days were numbered. Eight, the UK, quote, 
put measures in place to protect U.S. interests. By limiting the scope of the public inquiry into the UK's involvement in the Iraq war, fueling further public debate about the US-UK relationship. 9. The US had systematically sought to undermine the ICC. 10. US war crimes in Iraq, including the killing of civilians. 11. The State Department had made knowingly false representations to Congress about the Colombian government and military's human rights record, despite evidence of the killing of civilians. Significantly, the Department of Justice under President Obama decided not to prosecute Julian Assange in respect of the revelations. Equally significantly, the DOJ under the Trump administration was pressured into reversing the Obama administration's approach and prosecuting Julian Assange, despite the implications for the constitutional protections of the First Amendment. The decision made under the Obama administration not to prosecute Julian Assange in 2013 was because of what has been described as the New York Times problem. The prosecutors concluded that charging Assange would have been in violation of the First Amendment. The prosecution of Julian Assange, initiated in December 2017, was the result of the conflict between Assange's actions and the incoming administration. In response to WikiLeaks publications of the US diplomatic cables, President Trump called for the death penalty or something for Assange. He also denounced Obama's commutation of Manning's sentence, describing her as a traitor who should have never been released from prison. When he became president, he effectively declared war on journalists and leaks, and even went on to call for the execution of journalists. Julian Assange and WikiLeaks also attracted the enmity of the CIA by publishing Vault 7, the largest ever publication of confidential documents on the agency, in March 2017. Other publications had angered and exposed the CIA as engaging in unlawful activities around the world. In 2015 and 2016, WikiLeaks also revealed that the NSA had been spying on high-level government officials in France, Germany, Italy, Japan and Brazil as well as the United Nations and European Union. These publications upset the relations between the US and its allies. Significantly, from March 2017, WikiLeaks also campaigned against President Trump's appointees, Mike Pompeo and Jeff Sessions, and Gina Haspel, the head of the CIA. Pressure was then put on prosecutors by the Attorney General to bring an indictment, despite scepticism from career professionals about its legality and open objections from prosecutors directly involved in the case. Significantly, CNN reported in April 2017 that prosecutors have struggled with whether the Australian is protected from prosecution by the First Amendment, but now believe they have found a path forward. This political pressure led to the criminal complaint of computer misuse being made against Julian Assange on the 21st of December 2017. The prosecution was not only novel, it was also selective, since other US-based organisations that publicised the same materials, such as Cryptome and the Internet Archive, were left untouched. There followed the initial indictment in March 2018 for conspiracy to commit computer intrusion and computer espionage. This remained sealed at that stage as the administration laid further plans to have him removed from the embassy before the indictment was publicly unsealed in 2019. No explanation has ever been given for bringing forward this indictment in 2018, nor for the latter edition in 2019 of the 17 further charges of espionage. At the same time, Julian Assange's conversations with his lawyers were being constantly monitored by a private agency, UC Global, acting on the instructions of US intelligence and for their benefit. Moreover, 
the contents of their electronic devices were unlawfully copied. There then followed a concerted effort by the Trump administration to ensure that Julian Assange was expelled from the Ecuadorian embassy by a process of pressuring and bribing Ecuador into expelling him so as to make him available for extradition. The plan was to ensure that he was prosecuted for the Chelsea Manning disclosures and expelled from the embassy to face prosecution. Julian Assange was finally expelled from the embassy on the 11th of April 2019 and arrested. His privileged legal papers were also seized and conveyed to Ecuador from where they were later transferred to the United States. Then, in May 2019, a dramatically new superseding indictment was brought, which now charged Julian Assange with 17 further charges under the Espionage Act. But resort to the Espionage Act for a publisher was both unprecedented and sinister. The new indictment charged Assange with publication of state secrets and dramatically ratcheted up the scale of the charges, the pressure on him and the potential penalties. He faces up to 175 years in prison if convicted of all offenses in the superseding indictment. This decision to prosecute for publication of state secrets was unprecedented this was stressed by witness after witness. One witness stated that the series of charges related to mere receipt and possession of Manning materials seek to criminalise national security journalism itself and spell the end of such public interest journalism. The second superseding indictment dated 24 June 2020 appears to have come in response to the criticisms of inadequacy in the prosecution case. Thus, it artificially manufactures a conspiracy extending beyond 2013 and into 2015 so as to justify prosecution despite the 2013 decision and the long delay under Obama. Furthermore, it seeks to depict Julian Assange as a continuing threat to the U.S., to link him to Edward Snowden, and to pretend, present him as the leader of a wide-ranging conspiracy to gain unauthorized access to government computers. The means of employment and the targeting of Julian Assange further show that he has been made the object of exceptional extra-legal measures. All this points to a clear disregard for the rule of law and a gross violation of Article 22 of the Vienna Convention of Diplomatic Relations, which guarantees the inviability of diplomatic premises. And it took place in this country, which is relevant to the question of abuse. Further evidence of the bad faith and abuse of power was the approach to Mr. Assange by Republican Congressman Dana Rohrbacher in August 2017. Mr. Rohrbacher visited Julian Assange and discussed a pardon deal in exchange for personal assistance to President Trump in the inquiry then ongoing concerning Russian involvement in the hacking and leaking of the Democratic National Committee emails. Julian Assange is protected from extradition because espionage is a pure political offense. And Article 4.1 expressly protects from extradition for political offences. For all these reasons, it is submitted that there is jurisdiction for the court to stay these proceedings on the basis that extradition for political offences is an abusive process, given that it would violate the express terms of the Anglo-US extradition treaty. An individual exposes whole-scale abuse and war crimes by a state and thereby attracts prosecution for the very act of such exposure is entitled to the protection of Section 81A and also to the protection of Article 4 of the treaty. The chronology of the case itself, the reversal of the Obama administration's approach, the novel and unprecedented legal basis of the prosecution and the misleading nature of the evidential case presented 
all together point to a politically motivated prosecution. And for all of these reasons, Mr. Assange invokes the protection of Section 81A. Turning to Section 81B, the test is whether there is a real risk or a reasonable chance that Julian Assange will be prejudiced or discriminated against at his trial, at the sentencing stage, or in the manner of his subsequent imprisonment by reason of his political opinions and or his foreign status. It is submitted that there is such a risk for the following reasons. 1. Mr. Assange has been publicly denounced by the most high-ranking public officials, including the President, because of his political opinions. 2. The U.S. are taking the position that he has no First Amendment rights as a foreigner. 3. Mr. Assange's political status will also result in him being held in especially harsh prison conditions. 4. The intelligence agencies, including the CIA, will have considerable influence on his fate. In this context, it is relevant that the CIA has already indicated its intention, through its former chief, Mike Pompeo, quote, to become a much more vicious agency, end quote, and clearly will not change overnight under any new administration. Finally, Julian Assange's trial, sentence, and subsequent detention will all take place in the context of a criminal justice system that lends itself to political manipulation. There are substantial grounds for believing Mr Assange's extradition will carry a real risk of an Article 7 violation for the following reasons. 1. Key components of the offence for which his extradition is sought are so broad, vague and ambiguous that they do not meet the minimum standard of accessibility and foreseeability required by Article 7. 2. The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is similarly broad, vague and vulnerable to political manipulation. 3. Mr Assange could not reasonably have foreseen that the acts which he is alleged to have committed would have involved the commission of an offence. The current law is derived from the Espionage Act 1917, the sweeping breadth of which was drawn to catch not just espionage in the traditional sense, but also any individual who, by their opposition to US involvement in World War I, would inject the poison of disloyalty into matters of state. Expressly introduced by the then president to be a firm hand of stern repression, its indefinite language allowed the acts to be used as a vehicle for oppression and designed to be catch-all. It was described by scholars as incomprehensible with incredible confusion surrounding the issue of criminal responsibility for collection, retention and public disclosure of defence secrets. Even its proponents had to be content to rely upon, quote, prosecutorial discretion to ensure its provisions were not enforced politically. For example, the modern classification system allows the executive rather than Congress to decide the scope of the phrase national defense information by determining what information is classified. Many studies have found that government very often overclassifies information such that information whose disclosure could not reasonably expected to cause damage to national security is classified. The provisions of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act dealing with national defense information are taken directly from the Espionage Act and contains identical language as the Espionage Act. Necessarily, therefore, it suffers from similar breadth that enables the Espionage Act's enormous malleability. Its most prior notorious use for the prosecution of co-founder of Reddit Aaron Swartz, who later committed suicide as a result, was accepted by the Justice Department to have arisen in part due to Mr. Swartz's political beliefs, which, like those of Mr. Assange, included advocacy for open information. 
Its use against Mr. Assange in this context is no less profoundly troubling. All defense witnesses to whom this issue was put accepted that the act has survived various vagueness challenges over the years. But all told, this court that vagueness is situation specific. And because the act has never been applied to the press before, no existing authority assists with whether its operation in that context would be held constitutional. An authoritative review of the Espionage Act considered its terms as posing, quote, the greatest threat to the acquisition and publication of defense information by reporters and newspapers, end quote, and as, quote, a loaded gun pointed at newspapers and reporters who publish foreign policy and defense secrets, end quote. In 2010 to 2011, the relevant time under consideration, it was wholly unforeseeable that such an indictment could or would be issued against a member of the press for obtaining, receiving, or publishing leaked classified information. Likewise, Cryptome and other websites that published the unredacted cables ahead of WikiLeaks were never prosecuted. The unredacted cables hosted by those US-based sites are still hosted there and Cryptome confirms that the U.S. has never requested their removal. The importance of press freedom is such that Article 10 even imposes positive obligations on states, including, for example, the protection of journalists against violence. The indictment seems to criminalize the soliciting, receiving and publishing of national defense information, which from a journalistic standpoint essentially boils down to news gathering. It has triggered an outcry from human rights and civil liberties organisations, but most of all from journalists. Not because of affection for Assange, but because, as one wrote, it characterises everyday journalistic practices as part of a criminal conspiracy. Not only is the conduct the subject of this indictment, quote, the essence of journalism, unquote, WikiLeaks steps to force the world's disparate media to cooperate together in this publication process was, quote, a game-changing moment in the history of journalism. As every witness explained, to reason that because the whistleblower herself commits an Espionage Act offense by leaking classified information to the press, anyone, including the press who encourages, facilitates, solicits that act is legally liable as a conspirator in that crime is a theory of criminality liability without foundation or precedent. It would criminalize news gathering. It would criminalize the mere act of having this material with you. It would criminalize every single reporter who has ever received any document, whether they asked for it or not from a source that potentially broke the law. No journalist has ever been prosecuted under the OSA for the act of obtaining or receiving or publishing leaked information. Undoubtedly, because much more stringent considerations apply to the prosecution of journalists, both in terms of the protections of the law and public interest. Next, the U.S. suggests that the passcode hash allegation is such an example of prohibited separate criminality. But as Mr. Feldstein testified in court, trying to help protect your source as a journalist is an obligation. So if that becomes criminalized, if that becomes conspiring, then most of what journalists do, investigative journalists on national securities, would be criminal. It is inconceivable that the ECTHR would regard law breaching undertaken in order to protect the whistleblower's anonymity as capable of taking journalistic actions outside the protection of Article 10. The prosecution has finally attempted to draw a distinction 
between Mr. Assange and other journalists on the basis that his extradition is not sought, quote, in respect of any responsible journalistic treatment of the material provided by Chelsea Manning. In reality, if the publisher's entitlement to the First Amendment protection, or indeed protection under Article 10, turn on whether the government believed the publisher had exercised editorial discretion appropriately, the First Amendment's protection would be unavailable precisely in the cases publishers needed it most. Unsurprisingly, therefore, no authority is cited in support of this bizarre theory. Neither is it a prosecutorial theory that withstands any historical scrutiny here or in the U.S. Whether or not anyone considers Julian Assange a journalist is beside the point. He was engaging in journalistic behavior. He was acting as a publisher. Assuming that the First Amendment will be considered at all by any prospective trial judge, then this court should conclude on the compelling evidence it has heard that the First Amendment will prevent this prosecution. The US efforts to suggest that the First Amendment, Article 10, should not apply are in fact undermined by significant and deliberate factual misstatement with regard to each of its three central allegations. Namely, 1. The allegations that Manning's disclosures were causally solicited by the WikiLeaks draft most wanted list is flatly contradictory to the evidence given in Manning's court martial and publicly available information. 2. The passcode hash allegation was contrived knowing yet concealing from this court that it was flatly contradictory to the evidence given by US government witnesses before the Manning court martial. Three, the allegation that WikiLeaks deliberately put lives at risk by deliberately disclosing unredacted materials is also factually inaccurate. All of these assertions are in reality deliberate factual misstatements that not only false allegations are brought is not only indicative of the political motivation lying behind this request, but actionable in their own right. A prosecutor or judge requesting extradition could be held to be abusing the court's process where he knew he had no real case, but continued to seek extradition for another motive and accordingly tailored the choice of these documents accompanying the request. The evidence also shows that the draft most wanted list correlation allegation that Mr. Assange was involved in the original data theft is completely misleading. Moreover, the encrypted hash value which Manning shared was insufficient to be able to crack the password in the way the government have described. This would be known to anyone with basic technical knowledge. Even the government's own expert witness in the court martial stated that that was not enough for them to actually be able to do it. A further allegation made by myriad US officials is that Mr. Assange is no journalist because he published classified materials without redaction and so created a grave and imminent risk two people he named through publication of the War Diaries and the Cables. The government's arguments have been devoted almost entirely to this issue. But the allegation is known to the US government to be completely and utterly misleading. The truth is that WikiLeaks was in possession of the material for a considerable period before publication and went to extraordinary lengths to publish in a responsible and redacted manner. And that unredacted publication was undertaken by third parties unconnected to WikiLeaks. The US government knows well, but has withheld from this court, that this release of unredacted materials came about as a result of a series of unforeseeable events outside of the control of Mr. Assange or indeed WikiLeaks.
WikiLeaks did so in circumstances where, quote, the full database was already downloadable from hundreds of sites. Any possible exposure to harm was caused by the predicate actions of Cryptome, Pirate Bay, etc., in releasing the unredacted cables. The WikiLeaks publication disclosed US involvement in torture and war crimes. They sit at the very apex of public interest disclosure. The prohibition against torture is a peremptory norm of international law. War crimes and rendition are grave breaches of international law and a profound affront to the international legal order. They are also notoriously difficult to detect and expose because of the secrecy that surrounds them. The subject matter of the publications is currently the subject of criminal investigations of the CIA before the ICC. Attempts by the US government to obtain impunity for its war crimes are a separate, egregious violation of international law. WikiLeaks cables also evidence the lengths the US government subsequently went to pervert such investigation. As detailed above, but purposefully excised by the extradition request, the release of the 2006-2008 versions of the US-Iraq rules of engagement was integral to the release to the public of the collateral murder video. The US Army helicopter video footage is as disturbing now as it was in 2010. It shows the killing of 11 people by a US helicopter in Baghdad on the 12th of July 2007, a full version of which the US government had refused to release, instead issuing flat denials of wrongdoing, such that at the time it was impossible to prove that all those who died were unarmed civilians, including two Reuters journalists, despite compelling witness evidence. It disclosed acute criminality, which the US government sought to actively cover up and which could never have been established through more traditional journalistic efforts. The release of the video was picked up by thousands of news organisations worldwide, sparking global outrage and condemnation. It will be hard to overstate how important it was. The Guantanamo detainee assessment briefs provided evidence that Guantanamo detainees had been the subject of prior rendition and detention in CIA black sites before their arrival at Guantanamo. The briefs also documented the nature of the evidence relied upon by the US to justify the detentions including the repeated use of information and informants known to be unreliable or to have been tortured, and in some cases the detention of persons known to be innocent. The disclosures were really important because the world did not know the allegations. The use of evidence obtained by torture and arbitrary detention of this nature are international crimes of colossal proportions. The Afghan war diaries revealed what seemed to be war crimes. The Iraq material covers the six year period from the 1st of January 2004 to the 31st of December 2009, exposing numerous cases of torture and abuse of Iraqi prisoners by Iraqi police and soldiers, as well as proof of the US government's involvement in the deaths and maiming of more than 200,000 people. The Iraq War Diaries attracted worldwide opprobrium, leading to calls for proper investigations into the conduct of Allied troops. The public has a right to know about the existence of such violations, and states have a concomitant duty not to conceal them. As Mr. Assange himself explained publicly in August 2011, WikiLeaks had exposed the everyday squalor and barbarity of war information which was kept secret by the US military. His motivation was manifest, quote, if wars can be started by lies, peace can be started by truth. Daniel Ellsberg draws parallels 
between the revelations he brought about in the leaking of the Pentagon Papers and their impact upon the approach to the Vietnam War with the WikiLeaks exposures. He considers the latter to be the most important truthful revelations of hidden criminal state behavior in U.S. history. WikiLeaks publications, in fact, played a part in bringing a formal end to U.S. military involvement in Iraq by evidencing in an irrefutable way particular criminal acts on the part of the U.S. military, which had been deliberately covered up, and from about 2011 to the present time, there has been much greater caution among Western countries, specifically the United States and the United Kingdom, in the willingness to go to war at an early stage. I think that this is to a considerable extent due to WikiLeaks. Amnesty International credited WikiLeaks with sparking the Arab Spring via these releases, including as a catalyst for the Tunisian revolution. For his disclosures in the public interest, Mr. Assange was awarded inter alia the Sydney Peace Medal, the Walkley Award for Most Outstanding Contribution for Journalism, Australia's Pulitzer, and has been nominated year on year for the Nobel Peace Prize. War crimes such as those revealed by the WikiLeaks are the primary subject matter of the ICC. On 20th November 2017, ICC prosecutor Ben Suda submitted to the pre-trial chamber a request to open a formal investigation against the US in respect of the war crimes committed by US troops and by the CIA in Afghanistan and elsewhere in connection with the war on terror in Afghanistan. The criminal complaint against Mr. Assange materialized in December 2017 days after the prosecutor's investigation request. It is reasonable to infer that the two events were linked. Torture is banned by international law, and no derogation is permitted, even in times of armed conflict or terrorist attacks. This is a prohibition under customary and treaty law, specifically in the UN Convention Against Torture. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and Common Article 3 of the 1949 Geneva Convention. Second, under Articles 5 to 8 of the Campaign Against Torture and under the Rome Statute, torture amounts to a war crime or a crime against humanity and, quote, it is the duty of every state to exercise criminal jurisdiction over those responsible for international crimes. Third, failure by states to initiate a prompt criminal investigation into allegations of torture is itself a de facto denial of the rights under the CAT and the ICCPR, as well as customary international law. Failure by states to do so eviscerates the prohibition against torture and itself violates Article 3 of the Convention. The U.S. government has long sought to evade the jurisdiction of the ICC for war crimes committed by the CIA. In the wake of events of 11 September 2001 and the U.S.'s actions subsequent to it, President Bush informed the U.N. Secretary General that the U.S. did not intend to ratify the Rome Statute or recognize obligations under it. The U.S. then put in place bilateral Article 98 agreements over 100 ICC states to ensure other states would not arrest or turn over U.S. personnel to face ICC prosecution. The U.S. then passed legislation in 2002 which actively prevented U.S. cooperation with the ICC and further amendments threatened cuts in aid to foreign states that would not sign Article 98 agreements. Aid cuts were in fact implemented against seven ICC states and two intergovernmental programs. In November 2016, after a decade-long preliminary investigation, the ICC announced that there would soon be a decision taken on whether to investigate the US for war crimes in Afghanistan. 
The US responded by saying it was not warranted or appreciated given the US's own robust system of accountability. Quite the opposite is true. On 25th September 2018, President Trump stated at the UN General Assembly that the US considered that the ICC had no jurisdiction, no legitimacy and no authority and he would never surrender America's sovereignty to an unelected, unaccountable global bureaucracy but rather embrace the doctrine of patriotism to defend America from global governance as well as other new forms of coercion and domination. On the 15th of March 2019, Mr Pompeo announced that visas would be denied to all ICC staff investigating US personnel and their allies in Afghanistan, specifically stating that the US would be prepared to take additional steps, including economic sanctions, if the ICC does not change its course. The US then did revoke the ICC prosecutor's visa. Two weeks later, on April 19th, 2019, the ICC did change its course. Despite finding a reasonable basis to believe that members of the US armed forces and the CIA committed the war crimes of torture and cruel treatment, outrages upon personal dignity and rape, and other forms of sexual violence, and finding that these incidents fall within the jurisdiction of the court as a war crime, the ICC pretrial chamber nonetheless refused the prosecutor's request to open an investigation as not in the interests of justice. However, on the 5th of March, 2020, this decision was reversed and an investigation authorized by the ICC Appeals Chamber. In the wake of that decision, the threats made by the US quickly materialized. First, on 17th of March 2020, Mr. Pompeo, then director of the CIA and one of the subjects of the ICC investigation, issued thinly veiled threats to specific ICC staff members. In short, the unchallenged evidence shows that the US is prepared to go to any lengths, including misusing its own criminal justice system to suppress those able and prepared to try to bring its war crimes to account and protect those accused of them. Mr. Assange was one of those persons. The timings of the US actions in this case when set against the parallel progression of the ICC investigations that Mr. Assange helped bring about are no coincidence. The evidence of a number of experts supports the submission that there is a real risk that Julian Assange will be exposed to a flagrant denial of justice, both at trial and at the sentencing stage, and that he faces a sentence of somewhere between 20 years and a full 175 years, which the government could easily ask for. It was made clear that there would be pressure put on him to plead because of his massive potential sentence and the likelihood that he would be subjected to SAMS, Special Administrative Measures. The system will be skewed even further against Julian Assange because this prosecution will be located in Alexandria, Virginia from which a jury pool comprised almost entirely of government employees and or government contractors is guaranteed. He will be liable to be tried on the basis of evidence obtained from Chelsea Manning by inhuman treatment and torture. In addition, his trial will be seriously prejudiced by the public denunciation of him made by serious administration officials from the president to the present secretary of state and successive attorney generals. This intemperate public denunciation violate the presumption of innocence as established by the European Court. For these reasons, Mr. Assange's extradition would violate Article 6 of the Convention. There is a real risk that Julian Assange will be exposed to inhumane treatment in the United States 
That is firstly because there is a risk that he will be subjected to a disproportionately long sentence for his actual conduct. The sentence could be as long as his whole life and certainly is likely to be between 30 and 40 years. Now, a sentence of this length is not just permitted, but strongly indicated by the guidelines because of the way in which the case has been prosecuted and the way in which the two superseding indictments have been framed. This creates a real risk of a massively disproportionate and wholly inappropriate sentence, given that the conduct now alleged was not even deemed criminal by the DLJ under the Obama administration. But more particularly, the real risk of inhuman treatment arises by reason of the fact that Julian Assange, a psychologically vulnerable person, suffering from depression and autism spectrum disorder, is most likely to be subjected to conditions of solitary confinement, both at the pre-trial and post-trial stages, in spite of his mental vulnerability. Those very facts, Father, make his extradition unjust and oppressive by reason of his mental disorder. Both the English High Court and the European Court of Human Rights have expressed profound concerns about the potential inhumanity of conditions in so-called administrative segregation in the US prison system, amounting effectively to solitary confinement, particularly for those with special mental vulnerability. We are dealing here with an extremely vulnerable person with a long history of clinical depression, a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome, and an established risk of suicide. Detention in such conditions for Julian Assange would be the height of inhumanity. Prisoners detained at ADX Florence spend from 20 to 24 hours per day locked alone in their cells. They are not permitted any association with other prisoners and they are not permitted any group activities at all. The court heard evidence that the former warden of ADX Florence had described the condition as not built for humanity, that being there, day by day, it's worse than death. It is significant that he had worked for the BOP for over 20 years and was the warden of ADX Florence between 2002 and 2005. So he spoke with some authority on this subject. So the court can see that there is clear evidence of a real risk that Julian Assange, despite his confirmed diagnosis of depression and his liability to deteriorate in conditions of isolation, will be held in ADX Florence in H unit in conditions of isolation. That his detention there will be indefinite, that it will be subject to no proper review, and that it may go on for many years without him receiving proper medical treatment. That of itself is enough to render his extradition a breach of Article 3. On the 25th of September 2020, the court exercised its management powers to exclude the evidence of Professor Craig Haney dated the 23rd of September 2020. Julian Assange accepts that the court was seeking to exercise a case management power. However, the court is invited to take account of the plain fact that the assertions of Luke Field and Kronberg about the regime at ADX Colorado, and particularly the regime in H-Unit, are directly contradicted by the leading expert on solitary confinement in the US, who has actually visited and toured ADX Florence on a number of occasions, and has shown that the criticisms made by expert witnesses are well founded. When it comes to considerations involving the risk of inhuman conditions of detention, the court will obviously be concerned by the evidence of government witnesses who cannot be challenged in cross-examination that was produced very late in the day and that was, within a short space of 20 days, strenuously criticised by Professor Hanning. That bare fact cannot, it is respectfully submitted, be ignored. Section 91 affords a protection from extradition where extradition would be rendered unjust or oppressive by reason of physical or mental disorder. In this context, Mr. Assange relies upon the evidence of expert psychiatrists and psychologists who deal with his history of clinical depression and trauma 
and the high risk of suicide if he is extradited to the U.S. Moreover, there is a very real risk that Julian Assange will be driven to take his own life by the very prospect of extradition or the very fact of being extradited to the U.S. given the lengthy detention and inappropriate and inhuman conditions that he knows await him there. Finally, the court must consider the passage of time and whether to apply the protection against extradition where it has become unjust and oppressive by reason of the same. If it really is self-evident that Mr. Assange should be the subject of prosecution, the court is still left with the question as to why there has been such a long delay in prosecution Mr. Assange for publications that took place in 2010-2011. That is relevant because culpable delay on the part of the state seeking extradition is a factor to be taken into account in deciding whether it would be unjust or oppressive to extradite now. Even if the decision to prosecute now was presumed to be justified, then the long delay does nonetheless require some proper explanation. Absent explanation, the court is entitled to conclude that there was culpable delay in bringing the prosecution for these offences, which the US now say are very serious, when all the relevant factors were known at the latest by 2012. Despite requests, the US have offered no explanation for the absence of these allegations from the first or even second indictment where the allegations date from 2009 and could have been prosecuted at any time in the last decade, including prior to the emergence of the Swedish proceedings. Neither has there even been explanation for why this new request arrived a year and a half after their commencement, six months after opening submissions, days after the final defense evidence deadline had passed, and just days prior to the third listing of the extradition hearing. Despite its 7th of September ruling, this court has declined to admit evidence outlining the areas of defense evidence that would have been adduced had time permitted. But in accordance with that ruling, the defense position remains that this court must excise the new allegations from the request because the court is not in a position to answer fairly one or more of the statutory or non-statutory questions. For example, The new allegations are obviously aged and date from 2009. As stated above, the US have offered no explanation for the decade-long delay in bringing these charges. On its face, the delay here was culpable. By deliberate omission, this court is being provided with a singularly distorted picture of the cogency and efficacy of the allegations leveled in the new indictment. These cumulative omissions are, in their own right, the sort of non-disclosure which courts in the UK have previously found to warrant discharge. For all the reasons set out above, it is submitted that this extradition request should be refused. That is because it is politically motivated, it is an abuse of the process of this court, and it is a clear violation of the requirements of the Anglo-US treaty that governs this extradition. It exposes Mr. Assange to the real risk of an entirely unforeseeable prosecution under a capricious extension of the law and to a trial and sentencing process that constitute a flagrant denial of justice. It further exposes him to prejudice and discrimination by reason of his political opinions and foreign nationality, and to the virtual certainty of conditions of imprisonment that are both inhuman and oppressive. Finally, this unprecedented prosecution constitutes a flagrant denial of his right to freedom of expression and poses a fundamental threat to the freedom of the press throughout the world. Light them all up. Yeah.
Come on, fire. Hey, Roger. Keep shoot. Keep shoot. Keep shoot. Bushmaster, two things. Bushmaster, two things.